Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome. Uh, apologies for our three minutes delay in starting um, as uh, we were trying to just clear a few technical issues in the background. But we want to say thank you for all those who have already joined. And we give you a warm welcome. Susan Aka, I'm the Regional Manager of Global Six, the Western African Centre here in Accra. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all different parts of the world, you, our ardent and cherished participants, our esteemed resource persons for today, the speaker, Mr. Moderator, the director of the RCs at the University of Energy and Natural Resources, our reactors, and all our partners who are joining us, all protocol observed. By way of introduction, Global Six is an international looking for ethical leadership, integration of academic and public engagement, stead in Geneva, Switzerland, as an independent foundation with an international board, affiliated centers across the globe, and global network of teachers, students, professionals, experts, and partner institutions. In the course of our interactions today, you will get to know more about who we are and our free access online resources and how we can mutually partner in the journey of embedding Essex for transformational society. Engage in this session on the scene from waste to what's transforming energy consumption with efficiency. Now, before I continue, I want to say a brief word about our partner, the RCs with coming from the University of Energy and Natural Resources. RCs for short is the Regional Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability. And it is one of the 10 research institutes and centers at the University of Energy and Natural Resources here in Ghana. It was established under the World Bank funded African Higher Education Centers of Excellence for Development Impact Project and it is committed to conducting cutting edge research in energy and environment to support and promote sustainable development. It is also committed to promoting quality and excellent education that can transport sustainable development. Notably, RCs has won many awards and some of them, as you can see on your screen, include the Monal Project, the Gen Design Project, the Energy Service Center, the China South-South Cooperation on Climate Change and Professional Education for Renewable Energy in Ghana, among others. RCs currently runs postgraduate programs and short courses in the field of energy and environment. And I invite you to apply for these programs with the University of Energy and Natural Resources. We'll be exploring today our, in, in our engagement in, with our partner, the efficiencies in energy consumption with highlights on key technologies and strategies such as advanced building designs, efficient appliances, and sustainable transportation to reduce energy waste and improve affordability. Additionally, emphasis will be placed on the importance of policy, innovation, and public education in achieving long-term energy sustainability. As you can see on, our, on your screen, these are some of the objectives that we seek to, under the theme, we'll be providing an overview of the current energy sources, consumption patterns, challenges and opportunities for efficiency in Ghana. We will also be introducing various energy efficiency technologies and best practices applicable in achieving affordable energy for residential, commercial, and industrial sectors. We'll be discussing the benefits of energy efficiency, successful case studies of energy efficiency projects to illustrate the practical applications. We will review the existing policies and regulation and explore areas for potential improvement in advancing 
energy efficiency in Ghana. And finally, we will seek to identify and highlight the role of different stakeholders and explore the opportunities for collaboration and innovative solutions to advance energy efficiency goals. Before we go ahead, just some few housekeeping and have a smooth um, event today. This meeting is being recorded and it will be uploaded on the Globe Ethics YouTube page. This link will be shared with all of us hereafter. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself, including your name, your institution, and the part of the world you are joining us from. Also, look out for relevant information, which we will be sharing in the chat box in the course of our interactions. All questions should please be directed using the Q&A tab below your screen. We will make every attempt to address all your questions. The moderator will pick the questions and address them with our speaker for today. As you can see on your screen, this is just a quick program outline of what you should expect today. After we have our welcoming formalities, we will have brief greetings from the director of RCs from the University of Energy of Natural and Natural Resources. And we will go into for today. After that, we'll have a short interaction to tell you more about Globe Ethics. Then we'll go into our discussion sessions. Today, joining us to give a reaction on the speaker's presentation. One of them is coming from the, uh, the Energy Commission in Ghana, and the other is a sustainability expert who will also be engaging us and bringing some reactions. Then we'll bring you some information, important announcements from both the University of Energy and Natural Resources and Globe Ethics, giving you resources that you can engage with us on. So to continue quickly, and also the director of RCs, and then I'll open the floor for the director to bring us his opening remarks. To begin, our moderator for today is Mr. Michael. Wadi is currently the fundraising manager at the Ghana Integrity Initiative, which is one of Global Ethics Partner Organizations in Ghana. He has previously worked as the Corporate Affairs Manager at the Ghana Integrity Initiative, the manager of the Institute of Development and Participation Advocacy Officer of the Ghana Coalition of NGOs and Health and a Project Coordinator at Public Agenda. He holds an MA in Local Government and also organization from the KNUST, a BSc in Business Administration and Public Policy and Advocacy in track, Oxford, and a Certificate in Corruption and Good Governance from Marquette University in USA. You are very much welcome, sir. And then also, let me quickly welcome also the Director for RCs, which is partnering with us today to bring you this webinar. He is in the person of Professor Eric Ofosu Entry, and he's the founding director of the Regional Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability, which I have been referring to as RCs. He has been serving since 2019, where he facilitated the construction of the ultra-modern facility at the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Under the leadership of Professor Enchi, RCs has gained international recognition and attracted students from in integrated water resource management and has over the experience in civil engineering, energy efficiency, water resources management. Enchi serves as regional coordinator for the West Africa Centers of Excellence in Energy and consults for organizations like the World Bank and African Development Bank and has led multiple energy and water projects, including the ACE Impact and Sustain Dam projects. He's a pro prolific author and has published over 60 scientific articles on water resources, energy management, and hydropower. And he has also contributed to policy development in Ghana. He has also chaired several corporate boards, including the BA Waste and Allied Services in with a virtual applause to welcome engineer professor greetings from the RCs in the University of Energy and Natural Resources. The vigor with which you are handling this program.
we at RCs are very happy and we are very delighted that this program is coming up. We've been looking forward to it because um, it's an opportunity for us, for the whole world to know what RCs we stand for and also to market one of the best brains in energy in Ghana in the person of engineer Professor Samuel Jemfi. He has really impacted the energy scope in Ghana and we are happy that he's speaking on this great subject, waste to what? The world now has reached a stage of circular economy where we're trying to make sure that we recycle almost everything that we use to keep this world um, intact. And therefore today's seminar is going to be a great one. I also want to appreciate um, the presence of our visitors on one of the projects we're doing at RC is called the Elmo Project. We have a team of 10 persons from Sierra Leone who have been here this week, and they are taking part in this webinar. Um, seated left to me is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Fira Bay College University of Sierra Leone um, in the person of Professor Kele Mansari. And um, also we have um, some of the students, some of the lecturers from other universities. And then the project manager for the project in the person of uh, Mariama Whitmore, who works with um, Engineers for Change in Sierra Leone. So we are very, very happy to have all of you around. And we believe that this um, webinar is really going to be impactful. We're going to learn a lot from the experience and the research work that Professor Jemfi has been carrying around. And also an opportunity for us to sell our seas. Um, we want to reach out to the whole world and let the world know um, that there is, there is a great center in Ghana that is really championing energy transition. And we believe that Global Ethics will also help us in doing that. We appreciate the fact that Global Ethics, you reached out to us to partner with us in this webinar, and we forever remain grateful. I encourage everyone to follow this webinar, share your thoughts, please ask your questions. And at the end of the day, let us all work towards transforming waste to what? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, it is our pleasure to be working with you at the RCs and University of Energy and Natural Resources. We continue to build on this relationship and offer such educational and transformational events to our partners and our audience from across the world. I'd like to welcome the moderator now to take over as we go into the presentation session of this webinar. Mr. Michael Boydi, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, thank you, Professor Enchi. I think that uh, as part of the energy savings, I will not turn my camera on so that we can have uh, a better uh, um, a line. The line breaks at some point when the video is, is, is on. So forgive me uh, if I am hiding uh, behind the camera. I think that this uh, discussion is, is, is come timely, particularly following the um, discussions or the, the uh, infusion between a PRC and the ECG and the threats uh, uh, of the eminent uh, doomsaw if nothing is done. So a discussion about energy efficient is critical. Uh, energy efficiency in Ghana uh, is, is crucial, is a crucial aspect of the country's overall energy strategy. I mean, Ghana has been working to improve its energy efficiency, particularly in the residential sector, which accounts for 47% of total energy use. Ghana has undertaken initiatives like the sustainable energy for climate protection. We, we can talk of the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan. We talk of also the energy efficiency standards and labeling. All these initiatives have yielded some positives. We can, uh, amongst them is an 8,317.8 gigahertz uh, electricity savings, uh, 4.6 uh, million uh, tons of CO2 emissions reduction. Uh, the country has also saved 832 million in energy cost savings. But with all this, uh, there are still challenges that bedevils us. Uh, Ghana still faces uh, 
challenges in implementing energy efficient measures, measures including financial constraints, technological, uh, techno, techno economic barriers, lack of information. However, with a continuous effort and investment, energy efficient, efficiency can play a critical role in Ghana's sustainable development and climate change mitigation strategy. With that context in mind, I think that in the, today's meeting is, is critical to also provide us some keys. I reading through the, the profile of our eminent speaker, uh, I am convinced that we are slowly or going to gradually move from uh, the rhetorics to, uh, 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 to more action. But let me let you in on who is going to talk to us or who is going to present to us the main focus for, for which we are gathered today. The person who is speaking to us today is, is, uh, is no mean a person. He is a professor. Uh, he is an associate professor in renewable energy at the Energy and uh, at the University of Energy and Natural Resources, Sunyani, Ghana. He is a certified uh, sustainable energy management professional. Currently, he is the dean of the School of Energy and. And, and the Deputy Director of the Regional Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability. Our speaker holds a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. And he had led several multinational projects, including projects with the European Union, the Chinese government, and the German government, and also the World Bank. His research interests focus on the demand side management and how to improve energy efficiency behavior. So we are here to be informed uh, by somebody who knows his, his, his stuff. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to welcome engineer Professor Samuel Jemphy to speak to us on the topic, on the main topic, from waste to what? Transforming energy consumption with efficiency. Uh, I pray that his effort and his submission will not only will, will not fall on, on, on deaf ears, but will spare us on to uh, uh, pursue energy reform projects and uh, policies. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and Professor, Engineer Professor Samuel Jemphy, you have your audience. With a round of applause, let's welcome uh, Professor Jemphy. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, and thank you very much, Susan and Globe Ethics for the opportunity to give a presentation on a topic that is very, very important I mean, to us in Ghana and of course, also very, very important to the whole world. So I'm going to speak on transforming energy assets, I mean, in terms of how we can improve efficiency. So we've just given it a heading from waste to what, transforming energy consumption with efficiency. So um, I will start by giving an introduction uh, and then I'll move on to give an overview of the global energy situation. And of course, also give an overview of Ghana's energy situation. And then move into uh, energy efficiency, what it can do for us in terms of savings, in terms of cost reduction. And then I will take some case studies around the world and then look at policies and, and, and regulations that can support this uh, to happen and of course, uh, the role of stakeholders in, in this engagement. So as we all know, or we are all aware, uh, global energy demand is continuously increasing. And, and this increase is mainly driven by population growth and of course, industrialization and economic development. And as we can see, uh, in terms of in terms of the increase uh, or projected increase in demand, 
uh, a lot of it is coming from uh, non-OECD countries. And, and if we look at the demand in the OECD countries, it's more like uh, stabilized. And in most countries uh, in OECD, the demand has started I mean, decreasing or coming down. Now, if we looked at uh, um, about 750 million people that are without access to energy, especially electrical energy, I'm talking about electrical energy, it means that this, this demand will continue to increase. And uh, uh, if we are not able to come up with policies that will be able to, I mean, slow down the demand, looking at the fact that even if you look at people without access to electrical energy, uh, it's projected that it will still be around 660 million people by the year 2050. And if you look at uh, the sectors, the demand sectors, we have uh, a lot of demand coming from the electricity generation side. And this is where possibly we have to pay a lot of, a lot of attention to when we want to try as much as possible to reduce uh, energy consumption. Now I'm looking at uh, uh, global energy supply. So how are we meeting this demand? And if you look at uh, the current uh, uh, share of global energy demand in terms of the different fuels, we have fossil fuels still supplying about 80% of our demand. And we have uh, renewables achieving about 13%, and of course, nuclear also uh, featuring about 5%. Now, if we go back to 1973, and we looked at uh, the share of, of these fuels in our global energy supply, we can see that uh, fossil fuels were contributing about 86%. And it, this has dropped to about 80%, uh, but it's still very high. And, uh, and renewable has increased a bit uh, by about two percentage points. And then uh, if you look at nuclear energy, nuclear energy is still around, around 5%. Now, if we look at this, uh, in, in 1973, we had about six, 1,150 million tons of oil equivalent in terms of the total global energy supply. Uh, by 2023, it has uh, more than doubled. So if you look at the years between 1973 and 2003, you can easily calculate the doubling time, uh, doubling time around 30 to 40 years. I mean, so it means that our global energy uh, supply, I mean, in terms of meeting demand is not coming down. Uh, anytime soon. Now, <clears throat> now the consequences of uh, the use of fossil fuels, as we are all aware, is the uh, global increase in, in CO2 emissions. And, and this, is, this has been growing, growing as, astronomically uh, in terms of expon exponential rate of growth. And if you look at uh, the percentage increase uh, year by year, you see that the percentage increase in global CO2 emissions has always been on, on the positive side. So it, it means that every year uh, emissions are increasing, with the exception of maybe the um, World War I uh, and then the Great Depression in around 1923, there about in 1933. And of course, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, <clears throat> the recent decrease in emissions has mainly been due to the drive or the increase in uh, clean energy, especially uh, uh, improvement in energy, uh, the usage of solar PV, wind energy, nuclear energy, and of course, uh, technology introduction in terms of heat pump that, that are being used in most countries. And of course, introduction of electric vehicles, which is also growing at a very high rate. Now, this is, this is, apart from emissions, this is one of the challenges that we are facing in terms of global energy supply. I'm talking about oil. Uh, currently, about uh, more than 90% of our, the, the, our, our vehicles or energy that we use in our vehicles are based on oil. And uh, 
if you look at the projection to about uh, 2050, this will decline to just about 50%. So by 2050, we will have at least, I mean, fuel share in our vehicles uh, in terms of oil, so contributing to about 50%. Now, if you look at all the oil that we take from the ground, that is the blue line here. The oil that we take from the ground, currently about 60% is just being used for, for transportation, okay? For transportation, and that is expected to drop to to about uh, about 45 45 percent. Uh, so by 2050, at least the all the oil that we take from the ground, about 45 percent will still feature in transportation and in terms of vehicles, shipping lines, and 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 aviation. Now that is a concern because we looked at. Uh, um, the reserves that we have in terms of these fossil fuels, and we looked at the production. So we have what we call the reserves to production ratio. Now, if you look at oil reserves that we have, those that we have discovered that we are sure that they make economic sense to exploit them and, <clears throat> and with the technologies that can support them and everything, those that we are sure uh, we can recover at a very economic, economical rate. And if you look at the annual production and you divide the reserves to production, then oil is going to last us for about 58 years. Now, it depends on, it depends on where, the, where these uh, values um, will come from. Some estimates give the years to be 50, um, to be 20 years. Some give the years to be, to be about 25 and so on. So, so this depends on the estimate of the reserves. Now, gas will, will last us for about 51 years. Some estimate give it to estimate it to be 60 years and so on. At least coal is the one that will last longer, and that will take about uh, 139 years to get finished. Now, so that is one of the challenges. So if uh, if uh, oil is going to be depleted by say 20 years, 30 years, or maybe 50 years, 60 years, then what will happen to our transportation? Our transportation system will be facing some kind of challenge. Uh, that is one of the issues that we have. The second issue is, has to do with the oil discoveries. Now, we have here the past discoveries uh, in, terms of, in terms of wells that were drilled in the past. And if you look at it, the you know, giant wells and so on, they, they were all from, from the Middle East. And we can say that about 66% of our oil uh, supply, in terms of the global supply, is normally concentrated in one region, that is the, the Middle East region here. And that, again, poses what we call energy security challenge. So assuming one day oil supply from the East to the West is suddenly interrupted. That will create a lot of problems for us. So this is one of the challenges that we have to deal with also when it comes to oil. Now, now mostly we say that we'll find more, we'll find some more oil, we'll find some more oil. This graph here uh, looked at the, um, one of the major discoveries in recent times, the one that was discovered in the Gulf of Mexico. And if you put that in the same scale as those that were discovered in the past, uh, you will see that uh, that is very, very small in terms of uh, uh, comparing it to the past discoveries. So we will have challenges going forward and, and we have to uh, deal with that. Now, when we move from the energy supply as a whole and we come to just electrical energy, we also can see that in 2008, uh, fossil fuels were contributing about 68% of our global, uh, global electricity generation in terms of fuel share. And that in 2023 has dropped to about 60%. And uh, if you look at a uh, decrease uh, uh, in about uh, 7%, this is, this is not that much looking at uh, the challenges that we have 
as far as this uh, fossil fuels are concerned. Challenges with emissions uh, and challenges with the uh, range of availability and things like that. Now we also can see the growth in electrical energy demand. Here, the projected growth in electrical energy demand from 2023 to 2024 is projected to increase, uh, I mean, from around 2.5% to around 4% uh, from also from 2024 to 2025. This will, this will be the case. And uh, if you look at, in fact, uh, countries that are driving the growth, we have uh, China and India featuring very much in this. And so uh, this is to drive the economic aspirations of, of those countries. And we have to be aware of that. Now, when we move to Ghana, in terms of uh, our electricity um, uh, generation and, and electricity demand, now Ghana's population as of uh, 2021 was about 30.8 million. Now we are doing so well in terms of uh, national population with access to electricity, one of the highest in, in, the, in the continent, about 88%. In terms of households that are connected, about 86%. And of course, if you look at uh, uh, per capita electricity consumption, it's expected to increase from around 700 kilowatt hours to about 1,300 kilowatt hours by 2030. And, and, and so if you take Ghana, in fact, in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, we are doing so well when it comes to electricity access. And of course, the, the challenge has been the shift from the use of uh, hydro, which we have some constraints in that because of, uh, you know, the challenges with uh, rainfall and things like that. We are more and more and more moving into uh, thermal power plants that are more or less almost all uh, based on fossil, fossil fuels. So currently, uh, fossil fuels are getting about 70% of our electricity generation share. And then um, hydro is dropping um, year by year. Renewables in terms of others like wind, uh, solar, which we use very much, uh, is not so high, just about 1%. Now, when it comes to the energy as a whole, for the whole country, uh, we use a lot of biomass, biomass uh, to meet our energy needs. And then, of course, uh, the oil that we use, uh, natural gas, and, and, and then other energy sources. So biomass is, is very, very key to us. And biomass is currently being used uh, in an inefficient ways uh, that we should pay attention to uh, if we want to improve our energy usage. And in terms of the share of, of, of the different sectors that are driving this energy use in the country, we have a uh, uh, residential sector, which is taking, uh, like the moderator said, about, about 40, uh, 45, 46% of the share. And then we have the industry transport and, and uh, agriculture also uh, taking some share. Now, uh, the primary contribution to final energy consumption are mainly industry, transport and the residential sectors. Uh, in terms of residential sector, uh, the consumption uh, has slightly declined by about just 0.1% uh, from 2000, the year 2000 to the year 2023. Now the service sector uh, is also demonstrating a st steady rise with an average annual growth rate of about 5.2%, whereas agricultural sector is also showing uh, up trajectory with an uh, annual consumption uh, growth rate of about 4.7%. Now, one of the issues that we have as far as electricity uh, usage is concerned is that we have high losses uh, in the distribution sector. So these are two main distribution companies and their losses uh, 
uh, the first one here is the ECG losses, which is averaging around uh, 30%. Uh, and uh, that of NETCO also quite, quite close to that of, that of ECG. What it means is that um, um, electricity, just those that they are able to purchase, I mean, come through their network, just about 70 or a little above 70% are able to get to their consumers. So this is also another issue that we are dealing with and, and we need to improve infrastructure to be able to cut down on these losses. Now here I'm looking at uh, um, uh, energy that is purchased by these utilities in terms of uh, what they purchase and what they, 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 they are able to sell. So just about 10% of what they purchase it's also, it's also going into losses in terms of uh, commercial losses, uh, as they call it. Now, we have also um, high, what I call high inefficiencies at the end use side. End use side. In fact, we have a, a law that is supposed to ban the introduction or importation of these secondhand equipment into the country. But for some reasons, uh, they end up in the country. And, and if you go to the market, you will find these, these appliances, or uh, these equipment uh, being displayed and being sold. In fact, in their policy or in the law, Energy Commission has the mandate uh, to even get to the market and seize these items. Uh, uh, but I, I think there are challenges with that because it's not easy to kind of implement this, this law. Looking at where we find ourselves and the challenges that people are going through to meet their daily, their livelihood. And, and, and so we still have this challenge to deal with in terms, of, in terms of energy efficiency. Now, so if you put these issues, uh, the global issues, uh, I mean, together with the Ghana issues, now we have issues with growing demand, increasing demand, which I mean, we have to be able to meet. We have issues with supply challenges, especially looking at the fact that, you know, uh, a lot of oil is being produced from the East globally, as the consumption is in the West. Uh, dislocation of, of the resources from the, from the usage side, that are what I've just talked about. So posing what we call energy security challenge. And of course, environmental issues that, that we, are, we are facing. And in Ghana, we also talk about increasing usage of fossil fuels for electricity generation, which is also, I mean, giving us a hard time in terms of, uh, in terms of our GDP, because we are using a, a lot of money to procure these oils for, for these resources for energy, energy uh, energy generation of production. Now, so this is just one of the issues that we are facing in this world. The energy issues is not the only problem that we have. We have quite a number of them. Uh, we have issues with, with poverty, how to end poverty, zero hunger, okay, good health. And if you put all these issues together, we have about 16 issues under such broad uh, much broader headings that we need to resolve by the year 20, 2030. And energy happens to be just, just one of them. And uh, if you look at this uh, uh, SDG um, uh, target, uh, SDG goal seven, uh, ensuring access to affordable, reliable and clean energy for all, is, is something that we have to pay attention to and it's something that all countries are working towards. And if you look at this SDG goal seven, uh, in terms of the, the targets, now we have SDG seven deals with mainly two options. In, and, and those are the two options that we can use to kind of resolve most of the challenges that we have as far as energy demand and energy supply. Uh, are concerned. Now, we don't have so much option than maybe to ensure uh, the usage of uh, renewable energy. 
try as much as possible to increase uh, the share of renewable energies in our global energy mix. And of course, also the other option would be to double the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. So SDG 7, we, we talk about SDG 7, the focus is, is on these two main areas, improvement in energy efficiency and also uh, increasing the share of renewable energy. And that is supposed to help us to at least deal with the challenges that we have. Now, uh, by increasing the share of renewable energies, we will be able to cut down on our emissions. We will be able to improve on our energy security. We will be able to deal with uh, uh, the challenges of, of uh, energy, um, energy import and things like that. Now, with uh, improvement in efficiency, we will be able to cut down on our energy consumption. Now, when we cut down on our energy consumption and we use less and less and less amount of energy to achieve the tasks that we perform now, what it means is that we are, will be able to extend the, the range of availability of fossil fuels. I'm talking about the static range of availability. If we assume the reserves to be fixed, and also uh, the consumption rate to be, to be constant, then we'll be able to improve on this rate. And that will give us some more time. It will, we will use that to buy some more time until we are able to come up with technologies that will be able to run on other fuel in terms of maybe um, uh, our transportation system and, and others. So energy efficiency is key. So I'm talking about just the, th the first three targets uh, in terms of uh, SDG 7. And I'm looking at uh, SDG uh, 7 target 7.3, with where we're looking at energy, energy efficiency improvement. So what is energy efficiency? Energy efficiency refers to using less energy to perform the same tasks or achieve the same level of service. So using less amount of energy, I mean, to be able to perform whatever tax that you have to be, you have to perform. Now, energy efficiency improvement typically involves technological innovations, enhanced design and better energy management practices across different energy consuming systems like buildings, transportation, and the an industrial sector. And a typical example is the use of LED lamps. If you use LED light bulb, I mean, you look at the amount of light that you'll be able to produce compared to the usage of either incandescent light, light uh, then you'll be able to uh, produce more with less amount of energy. Now, when it comes to energy efficiency in terms of projections, in fact, it will be, IEA says that it will be able to deliver about 40% of the energy related greenhouse gas emissions that we need or that we will need to be able to stabilize our global CO2 emissions and to be able to also uh, or bring down our global CO2 emissions and also be able to stabilize our global average temperature rise to about 1.5 degrees C to 2 degrees C. That is uh, what is in the Paris Agreement. And it also helps consumers uh, to reduce their energy bills as we we all know or we are all aware of. Now, this energy efficiency is also one of the strategies that utilities I mean, use to try and get better utilization of their asset. So if we're talking about utilities, they have six main, uh, what we call load shape objectives. Now, there are points that, or uh, point in time that they will be interested in cutting, cutting the peaks, there are points in time that they would like to, they will be interested in bringing down the whole profile from a very high consumption level to a very low consumption level. And that is where energy efficiency plays very, very important role. So if we talk about the other load of shape objectives in terms of load building, value filling, uh, flexible load shape and load shifting, there are points where we have to maybe reduce our peak demand, so we shift load from peak to off-peak periods. 
Now, if you look at the, the second one, the second one deals mainly with, with energy, energy efficiency. So trying to bring down the whole profile from the high consumption level to a low consumption level. And of course, this uh, helps the utilities to get better utilization of their assets. Now, there are a lot of uh, technologies that can help us to, to improve on our efficiency. And uh, here are some examples of, of some uh, uh, technologies in the residential sector. We're talking about uh, LED uh, lighting systems. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, energy star rated appliances like refrigerators, washing machines, air conditioners, and, and, and others. We are talking about energy efficient windows and doors, uh, possibly insulation and, and things like that. And of course, um, we can also use technologies to control, to control demand in terms of smart technologies that can help us to kind of regulate our energy, energy demand. Now, if we look at the commercial sectors, there are a lot of uh, uh, technologies that can be employed in terms of building automation systems, uh, uh, integration, in, in, integrating of uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, and lighting and, and, and security all together, and high efficient uh, HVAC systems. Uh, uh, green buildings is, is now the, the, the way, you know, buildings are being certified and, and looking at how much a building is supposed to consume. Uh, we can cut down on, on that if we go into green building certification. And of course, uh, demand response is also one of the strategies that is being employed. Now, by demand response, what we looked at is to try and aggregate the demand reduction that can be achieved, especially at the peak demand period, and possibly uh, bring that also onto the market as a resource that can be sold onto the market so that the electricity wouldn't be generated or there will be no need to generate electrical energy in the first place during the peak period. So it's something that has uh, come up strongly in recent times, and we have a lot of interest in this. I mean, some markets are looking at how they can integrate demand response into the market, uh, market structure. Now, industries, we have uh, high efficiency motors and, and drives, okay, process optimization, uh, energy efficient light and control system, and of course, uh, waste recovery, waste heat recovery system. These are, these are some of the technologies that are already existing that can be already easily introduced into, into these sectors. Now, so what does it offer us? And what are the energy management best practices that, uh, that we can employ? Now, before you can introduce some of these equipment, at least uh, you need to have what we call an energy management uh, program or project in place. And when we talk about energy management, it's a whole process of trying to get uh, your energy use, uh, energy consumption reduced. And if you have to uh, come up with any energy management uh, program, one of the first things that you have to do is what we call conducting an energy audit. So you have to be able to assess the facility's performance in terms of energy use or energy usage and try to determine whether energy is being wasted by comparing energy use, uh, specific energy use of that particular uh, energy consuming system with what is supposed to be as far as the specific energy use parameters are concerned. And if you conduct an energy audit, you'll be able to assess the performance of, of that energy consuming system, assuming it's building, assuming it's a whole university, assuming it's a factory, a bread baking factory, you'll be able to assess the performance or their performance in terms of energy use, and then be able to come up with energy conservation opportunities. So what can be done to reduce energy consumption 
in these energy consuming systems. So when you come up with energy conservation opportunities, you just don't end there. You have to at least try and rank them in terms of the economic merit, in terms of what will be needed to implement that energy uh, management strategy and what you can get out of it in terms of, in terms of energy cost reduction. So that is very, very important. And, and Ghana, we are now going into energy audit and energy management. So we have uh, accredited, uh, Energy Commission has accredited as part of the MIDA project, accredited three institutions to be training energy management professionals, energy audit professionals, and energy audit practicals. Uh, so that they will be able to champion this side of uh, energy management, energy management uh, strategy. Now we also, as part of energy management, we also have to have an energy management and monitoring program in place to be able to implement real time monitoring system to be able to track energy use and identify trends, allowing for timely intervention in terms of energy wastage. Now, Employee training is also part of an energy management strategy. And of course, if you conduct an energy audit, you can come up with so many different energy, uh, energy saving opportunities. And, and one of them could be uh, uh, awareness creation or behavior of the people who are using energy or the energy in that facility. And so education, uh, is very, very key. And, and this is uh, at least one of the low hanging fruits when it comes to energy, energy management and energy efficiency. And of course, uh, maintenance programs that you can put in place uh, to also try and reduce energy wastage. So what are the benefits for doing energy management? The first and the most important one is cost savings. So if you go to any organization and you, you want to come up with an energy management strategy for that organization. The first thing that they will be looking up to is how much are we going to save in terms of, in terms of our energy costs. And that is something that you can use to also make an argument as to why there's a need to conduct an energy audit or have an energy management program in place. Okay. so. The first is cost savings, and of course, it can also help us to reduce our emissions. Now, if we cut down on our energy consumption, what it means is that we wouldn't need, would need to generate so, so much, and that uh, strategy will be able to help us to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, uh, uh, when it comes to oil and other fuels that have to be imported, it will also reduce your dependence on, on, on those fuels. And, and of course, uh, resource conservation is also key. Now, this graph here is showing us uh, the stated uh, policy scenarios, global stated policy scenarios. And then uh, those that have been pledged uh, and, and those that are, that are supposed to contribute to net zero emissions by the year 2050. And if you look at that uh, in terms of uh, stated policy scenarios, uh, and then the, the net zero scenarios, you see that uh, improvement in efficiency is more than doubling. So that is it's a key, one of the strategies that we are using globally to reduce on, on emissions. Now, so these are some of the things that can be done. And here I want to look at some case studies of, of typical energy efficiency projects or energy efficiency uh, or energy management project. Uh, uh, I will look first uh, as, as one of the key things that we did in Ghana in 2007. Uh, where we had a lot of issues with our electricity uh, supply. And in, in 2007, um, we distributed around 6 million 
CFLs in exchange for incandescent light bulbs. Uh, and uh, I, I, like, I would like to commend Mr. Jaco for this, for leading this uh, project, one of the key partners uh, uh, that led this project from the Energy Commission side. And this resulted in around 124 megawatt savings in terms of demand savings, energy savings of about 172.8 gigawatt hours per annum, and then a lot of CO2 savings around 112,000 tons per annum of CO2 savings. And of course, delay in thermal generation expansion investment of around 105 million US dollars. And the most important thing here is the household income savings of around 31 Ghana cities uh, across 25 districts nationwide over six months period. So this is, this is what energy efficiency can do. Now, what it means is that if you introduce energy efficiency, then uh, you wouldn't need to add so unnecessary to your, to your generation portfolio, so electricity generation portfolio. And this can also be used to buy time. I mean, because if you want to even, you are going through a crisis and you want to, you want to um, come out of it and your focus is on the supply side, like we normally experience in Ghana. Let's add to, let's add to the capacity that we have. Let's add to the capacity that we have. Even to go through environmental approval and all that, you'll be, you'll be spending about three years, four years before you can start the actual construction. The fastest maybe one year, two years. And uh, if you use energy efficiency, at least it will give you some time to bring down the demand so that at least you'll be able to I mean, take on the additions in terms of building more power plant uh, for the future. So this is one uh, case study. Now in Ghana too, we've had uh, what we call uh, uh, Ghana Refrigerator Energy Efficiency Project. Now under this project, uh, uh, a rebate and exchange scheme um, it was used. So you, you send your refrigerator uh, to those who were running this project, I think it was high sense or so, and then you get a new one. Okay, and then you top it up small with some small amount of money. And, and the, the target was to try and replace 15,000 uh, 15, uh, 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 refrigerators. And at the end of the day, they were able to achieve uh, I mean, just 10,000. But if you look at uh, the drop in, in consumption in terms of the usage of the usage of uh, uh, refrigerator. Uh, annual average refrigerator consumption dropped from around 1,200 kilowatt hours to just around 385 kilowatt hours. And that is quite huge. And, and that is what energy efficiency can do for us. So energy efficiency can be treated as an energy resource, okay, that can be acquired from the market and, and can be used okay, as part of the whole energy strategy of a country. Now, that also resulted in the energy electricity uh, consumption reduction of around 400 gigawatt hours, 1.1 million tons of CO2 emission reduction and recovered around 1,500 kilograms of chlorofluorocarbon over three year period with other major benefits that uh, also came along in terms of stability in the grid and so on that were not accounted for. Now, then I would also like to talk about this, uh, this uh, case study. This is uh, very common in the literature called uh, the perfect storm, uh, California 2020. Uh, in the year 20, uh, 2001, 2002, so around 2001, the whole state of California went into darkness because electricity consumption was increasing because of heat waves that they were experiencing at the time. And uh, uh, when consumption starts increasing, 
um, temperatures were also heating increasing and consumers were switching on air conditioners to try and, and be comfortable. And this went on for some time and the demand exceeded the available capacities of the line and the whole state just went into darkness. The lines collapsed, a lot of systems collapsed and they had to recover from this. Now, when they were recovering from this, they came up with a, a policy called, a strategy called California 2020. So we reduce your energy consumption by 20%, okay? Electricity consumption by 20% and you get 20% discount, okay? So if you reduce your electricity consumption by 20% from that of the previous year, you are also giving another 20% discount on, on your electricity consumption. So that resulted in about 5.3 million megawatt hours in terms of energy savings. And in terms of capacity savings or demand savings, it was about 2,616 megawatts in demand savings. And of course the program was uh, discontinued in 2002 when they had gone through the crisis and have been able to stabilize things. And of course, uh, uh, the program budget for 2001 was around 350 million. Now, the next case study that I would like to talk about is, uh, is this uh, Orion Energy Water Heating Load Reduction. Now, this Orion Energy is, is in New Zealand. And uh, when I was there, at the time, the, the capacity of the network of this particular company could not exceed this black line. So anytime they are just about to exceed the line or the, the capacity of the line, then they had to activate what they call the demand side management strategy. And the demand side manage, management strategy that they introduced was, uh, control of water heating cylinders. So in New Zealand, before you can use a water heating cylinder, that water heating cylinder has to be fitted with ripple control. And that allows the utility to be able to switch off the water heating cylinder in your house without coming there, okay, whenever they are just about to exceed the capacity of the line. And this uh, project, uh, this uh, strategy has been very successful in fact, in terms of managing, managing peak demand uh, for New Zealand. And if you look here, the, what we have here is the number of water heating cylinders that they are able to switch off uh, during the peak period to be able to bring the profile from the red line to the blue line. Now, this is normally done in the mornings and also in the evenings to try as much as possible to control the peak. And because they do it for water heating cylinder, because if you switch off water heating cylinder, it can stay off for some time, you know, and you still have warm water or hot water to do whatever you, you want to do. So this has been a very, a very good strategy for them. And if you look at the, the peak load reduction that they've been able to avoid with this strategy is around 120 megawatt. Estimated avoided costs in terms of uh, distribution network upgrade is about 12 million New Zealand dollars. And then when it comes to estimated uh, transmission, avoided transmission network cost is around half of that of distribution, around $6 million. So uh, <clears throat> energy efficiency will not happen by itself. You know, it's just like renewable energies. Uh, they will not by themselves I mean, happen because energy efficiency is still very expensive. And you will need to have some policies in place, in place to, drive, to drive this. And in Ghana, we have, uh, in fact, Ghana, we are, I mean, one of the leading countries in the sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to uh, uh, energy efficiency regulation and, and efficiency improvement policies. So we have our national energy policy uh, uh, that is supposed to provide a framework for ensuring a reliable and efficient supply of energy. And key provisions in that 
involves provision of energy efficient appliances and equipment, encouragement of demand side management practices, and of course, incentives for renewable energy and energy efficiency investment. And uh, this uh, moment is, is, is going well. Our Renewable Energy Act, which has been updated, also has a portion on uh, promotion of energy efficiency technologies uh, in the production and use of, of renewable energies. Now, we also have uh, uh, Ghana Energy Efficiency Standard and Labeling. And uh, its mandate uh, is to try as much as possible to get some of our equipment, I mean, at least uh, labeled in terms of their performance. So we have uh, key provisions in that. We are looking at implementation of minimum energy performance uh, standards for air conditioners, okay, refrigerators and lighting. So this has at least been, been, uh, been activated uh, in terms of, of this, this, this uh, policy. And we are hoping that maybe it will be extended to other electrical appliances. And of course, there's also a public awareness campaign to educate consumers about energy efficiency, which is also captured in that energy uh, policy document. Now we have uh, uh, existing policies also from the regulatory side in terms of PURC. Uh, Public Utility and Regulatory Commission is also uh, coming up with pricing strategy or pricing strategies to be able to uh, uh, I mean, achieve energy use reduction. I mean, this pricing strategy can, can, be, can be in a range of, of, of areas in terms of I mean, uh, strategy for uh, agricultural sector, strategy for residential sector and industrial sector. Now, so energy efficiency uh, is, is very important. Uh, it's, it's one of the things we should, we should focus on, but still uh, is not being realized. Uh, we have a lot of potential in energy efficiency, but uh, still we have uh, barriers and shortcomings. And those shortcomings, uh, some of them are listed here, in fact, the key ones, uh, across the group, we have incorrect energy price signals. Uh, energy uh, prices are, even though they are high in some countries, some countries still have very low energy prices. And if the person doesn't feel it in his pocket, I mean, there's no way you would take action to reduce energy usage. Now, there's lack of or incomplete information also. I mean, most people are not aware of what energy efficiency can do for them. In fact, even those of us here, you know, some are not aware about what energy efficiency can do for us. And it's something that we, we will need to, I mean, provide information on so that people will be aware of it. We have split incentives. Uh, this is not very common in our part, but uh, this is normally, I mean, an issue in New Zealand and, and Australia where if, you are a, a landlord before you rent out any apartment or any building, you have to make sure that the washing, ma the washing machine is there, stoves are there, the, the person can come and be able to cook the first day, okay? And be able to put some of the food in the, in the fridge. Now, when it comes to split incentives, the issue has been who should buy those high efficiency equipment, okay? So is it the, 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 the landlord if the landlord buys it, it's the consumer who will come and enjoy, enjoy a, a reduced uh, electricity bill. So there's also an issue, issue with that as to, I mean, who should, who should do that? Now, institutional and legal barriers are also an issue, and of course, technical and financial barriers. Of course, energy efficiency is still expensive. You know, to buy a three-star refrigerator is still not that cheap. Now, so let's look at uh, how to deal with some of these issues uh, in terms of uh, uh, to setting up standard for appliances and enforcement uh, of that. Uh, you may need to have some market 
uh, surveillance in place to be able to, to do that. Now, minimum performance, minimum energy performance standard. Uh, the current minimum energy performance standard, standard covers uh, just a few appliances. There's about three in Ghana here. We're talking about air conditioners, refrigerators, and, and lighting systems. So possibly we can, we can improve on that and add some more appliances, appliances to that. And of course, we need to also make sure that this uh, minimum performance standard, we also follow them, not just having them in place. Uh, awareness campaign is something that we can do, okay? Educate, okay? Uh, let people know about energy efficiency. Let them know about what it can do for them. In fact, energy demand side is, is considered as part of, part of an energy system. The whole energy system is made up of the, the, the resource, the supply, the supply resource. We're looking at we're looking at the transformation systems, and then we are looking at at the end use, the people who are using it. So the people who are using it. So if we are able to integrate them into the system to cut down on their energy use, at least we will need less and less amount of energy resources. And of course, we will have uh, we will be able to reduce our our I mean, dimensioning of our energy transformation or energy conversion systems. So these are all what we can do: tax incentives, uh, retrofit requirements, energy audit and support programs, and of course uh, national energy efficiency database. This is very very important, and we are trying to do that as part of, part of the MIDA project on energy efficiency. How do we get a national energy efficiency database? And of course, Energy Commission has been very instrumental in that. So the policy package can be in the form of regulation, information, and of course, incentives to consumers. Now, different stakeholders can play different roles. Um, when it comes to uh, the government and the regulatory bodies, they can formulate the laws but not just formulating them. They have to ensure that we follow through with these policies and, and laws and make sure that people uh, who have to be penalized will be penalized to do that. There's opportunity uh, for them to collaborate with the private companies to develop and fund large scale energy efficiency projects. Okay, partner with educational institutions and NGOs to train energy auditors, engineers, and other professionals in energy efficiency technologies and work with international organizations and donor agencies to assess technical expertise, funding, and best practices in energy efficiency. Now, the private sector also can play their role, which some of them have already captured. At least uh, there's opportunity to establish industry clusters where companies collaborate on energy efficiency uh, challenges and solutions um, such as improving industry energy management. Uh, opportunities to partner with energy service companies to implement energy efficiency projects, and then opportunities to co collaborate with, uh, with the suppliers to develop and ad adopt energy efficient processes and materials. Okay, so we have uh, also a role that can be played by the utilities, uh, the utility providers. We have, uh, roles that can be played by non-governmental organization and civil society organization, such as Globe Ethics, what they are doing here to try and bring this to the forefront so that at least people will be aware of what can be done to reduce our energy consumption. Now, financial institutions can give loans, okay, in terms of uh, the purchase of energy efficiency equipment, financing energy efficiency project. Academia, we are also doing our part, and of course, but we can do more. And then, of course, international organizations. So in conclusion, I will say <clears throat> the journey from waste to what highlights a critical role of energy efficiency, energy efficiency in transforming energy consumption patterns. Through the adoption of energy efficient technologies, behavioral change, changes and supportive policies, we can achieve significant cost savings, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, 
and enhance energy security, which are some of the issues that we are facing as far as uh, global energy uh, supply and demand are concerned. Of course, also Ghana's energy supply. We, as we move forward, a collective commitment to energy efficient practices or energy efficiency practices will be pivotal in addressing global energy uh, challenges and promoting suitable or sustainable energy, energy uh, development. Okay, so let's take actions now uh, and create a more efficient energy future for all of us. So the thought for the day, I uh, will have two main uh, based on the challenges that I outlined at the beginning. Uh, and <clears throat> energy efficiency is an aid in reducing the environmental impact of burning fossil fuels. It's a tool to develop smarter ways of managing our finite resources efficiently. And it's a bridge to develop clean fuel technologies and renewable energies so that we can at least extend the range of our availability of our fossil fuel resources. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, our honorable speaker. You have really done justice to the subject. In fact, joining the um, discussion, I was wondering what uh, type of uh, waste are we talking about? Is it the waste we generate at home or the industry, or we are talking about some other waste, but having thoroughly dealt with the subject, uh, I think I am better off joining than, than, than I'm better off now than I, before I joined. You have touched on practically every aspect of the objective. You, you gave an overview, you also introduced the very energy efficiency technologies. You, discuss, you, you exhausted the benefits by talking about uh, cost savings that energy efficiency bring, the reduction of greenhouse gases. You talked about reduction on our dependence on countries that produce fossil, 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 uh, fossil fuel. You, the savings, uh, foreign exchange savings, reduction of the burden of continuously increasing our uh, installed capacity and also buying time. I think that you indeed uh, then concluded by indicating the rules that the various energy, uh, the various stakeholders can play in bringing about energy efficiency. This is the time that I, I, all participants would have to have a say. The, uh, Madame Cecilia Hesse had raised his ha her hand for a, a long time, but Madame Cecilia, I think you will agree with me that if we allow the policy makers to speak or react, they will also bring a perspective that will may answer your question or uh, give you a much better outlook and then shape your question. So permit me to introduce a policy maker. Um, he is, the, he is uh, Mr. Kofi Ejako, is a director at the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Directorate at the Energy Commission. He is a seasoned energy uh, efficiency expert with both local and international experience. He contributed largely to changing prepaid metering systems at the uh, uh, Electricity Corporation and Ghana Water. At the Energy Commission, he played a key role in several projects, including the 2007 mass CFL exchange. I, you cannot exhaust the contribution he has made to Ghana by way of improving energy efficiency. He has, and one of the most uh, beloved uh, 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 credential he has is that he has not shied or does not shy away from engaging with the media. I think with the with virtual applause, let's welcome uh, our uh, next speaker, Mr. Kofi Ejako, to give us a policy perspective. If uh, we, once we grounded in that, we will be able to then uh, take questions, and I believe that will shape our question. If Mr. Ejako, I believe Mr. Ejako is ready for us, is he? Sure, I am. Yes, I'm moderator. Very well, very well. Thank you very much, Mr. Ejako. So we, the audience are yours now. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, cherished audience. And uh, Prof, thank you for that insightful presentation. Um, unfortunately, some other agent assignment took me elsewhere and I couldn't join on time, but I joined the meeting at just two slides to the case studies. And I must say that I really enjoyed the rest of the presentation from there. So what I'm going to do is that I'm now going to parachute into the meeting, hoping that I will land on my two feet. Um, I think that the, the professor has done justice to the topic. And I'm just going to, just as the moderator said, um, look at it from the policy angle. Um, I'll begin by saying that, yes, just as he rightly indicated, the, the, the drivers of global energy demand, uh, economic development, industrialization, and population growth. But the latest addition that has been identified is higher temperatures that we have started recording globally, especially in the tropics. And here, I will want to hone in to Africa. Africa is adjudged to be the, the, the highest continent with, uh, the continent of the highest um, urbanization out of population growth. We are growing at 3.5% annually. And that is adjudged to be the highest urbanization rate that you can find globally. And currently, we have 78 cities by using the 1 million population criteria. And it is estimated that, that by 2030, we will have 90 cities, urban centers to be precise, in Africa. And this is to tell you that when we have built up cities, then the incidence of heat becomes intensified and which automatically calls for um, demand for cooling appliances. So cooling appliances have the tendency to, to um, uh, grow in terms of demand in Africa in the next foreseeable years. And I hope you have not forgotten that among all the household appliances that we consume, air conditioners consume much more than all the other appliances. So there is the need for us to pay particular attention to energy efficiency, just as the uh, professor amply uh, demonstrated. Unfortunately, some unscrupulous companies have taken advantage of that, and they think that they can ship anything at all to Africa, and for that matter, Ghana. There is that erroneous percep uh, perception that Africa is poor, we are not interested in efficiency, and anything at all goes uh, for, for the ordinary African. And that is the reason why the Energy Commission, way back in 2005, decided to take the bull by the horn. That is when we ushered Ghana into the um, appliance and, and standards uh, regime. So from 2005, we worked with three appliances, just as he indicated, refrigerators, air conditioners, and lighting bulbs. But two years ago, um, we, through the assistance of MIDA, we have added 17 more. So now we have 19 appliances that have come under the appliance standards regime. From the kitchen, that is blenders, micro to the office computers, to the factory transformers. All these appliances have been, um, have come under the appliance standards regime. And we do this to ensure that Although demand for energy rises, but it does so at a reduced rate. Because um, 
civilization, economic improvement, social, cultural advancement moves with energy in demand. But there is always the need to find a way around it so that although demand will grow, it will grow at a reduced rate. Otherwise, you will end up turning your whole land into planting uh, uh, power plants. And that is also no good, taking into consideration the environmental concerns. In Ghana, household energy share is 40% of the total power that we generate, 40%. No wonder why you experience blackouts during the evenings. Unfortunately, our power demand peaks in the evening around 6 to 10. And when it happens like that, when we all put on the appliances, the transformers are unable to sustain the demand. So they trip. The utilities go there, put it in, 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 in order, and then it trips again. So they leave it, if you recall, around 10 p.m., then the lights come because by then a lot of the gadgets have been switched off. So we, there is a need for us to manage this 40% share. Uh, it is not the best. We need to have a sustainable uh, power consumption, whereby we give enough to uh, commerce and industry and proportionately a little for domestic consumption because the two are the indicators of uh, economic growth. That is um, commerce and, and industry, but not so much of um, domestic. It is also instructive to note that Ghana, since 1966, thereabout, enjoyed hydropower that is cheap and also environmentally friendly up until 1996, when the hydropower could no longer support the economy. So thermal complementation was put in place, and that is when the thermal plants were built in Abuazi. Initially, there were supposed to be peaking plants, that is, um, they will be run when uh, the demand is high and the Akosumbo is unable to contain the demand. But unfortunately now, Akosumbo rather is a peaking plant and the Abuazi plants are the base load, which has gone a long way to change Ghana's narrative in terms of CO2 emission. We used to be net sink of CO2, but gradually, the narrative is being changed and because the thermal plants are 60% as opposed to 40% of hydro. So this brings to the fore the need to have this energy efficiency conversation going. We need to have it going because we can't afford to relax and, and then get overtaken by events. So whilst we are priding ourselves that um, Ghana is inching towards the 90% electricity access, I think we need to be mindful of consumption. And that is what the Energy Commission has done by way of uh, introduction of the policy and the uh, enabling regulations to ensure that the standards put in place are enforceable. Because without regulations, the standards become voluntary. And voluntary standards do not achieve um, the desired results. So um, these laws have actually helped us. And if, you, if I decide to bore you with certain statistics, with just the implementation of the, the, the laws governing energy efficiency, we have recorded 11,000 gigawatt hours by way of savings by December 2021. 11,367 gigawatt hours by way of savings. And this is more than the capacity of Bui Dam. Bui in full blast, you are looking at 900 gigawatt hours in a year. And you might have not forgotten that 
Bui was built with a loan in excess of 600 million choppable United States dollars. So if that amount of money can produce peak 900, and then we have been able to save 11,000 just by the implementation of energy efficiency um, standards and, and level, then it goes to you know, point to the fact that it is cheaper to conserve energy than to build additional capacities to provide um, electricity. So um, to be able to move the agenda of energy efficiency forward, there's always the need to have a very solid energy um, service companies. We call them ESCOs. In the 1990s, we tried, but it, it failed for many reasons. So we have decided to revamp the ESCO model. And I'm sure the professor might have spoken about it. Um, now we have three centers of excellence and the university, the very university from which he, he, he works is one of the selected centers where we are training the young ones to come up as professional energy auditors. And these energy auditors professionally are going to supply us with the needed backbone to move forward the energy efficiency agenda. In, in, in terms of, you know, energy efficiency, you need to look at it holistically. It, it, it is in the same bed as renewable energy, but energy efficiency always herats renewable energy. If you have very good foundation in energy efficiency, then implementation of renewable energy becomes very easy. Because if you have these substandard appliances that, that are called energy gasless, if you have them in the system, then you don't make good use of renewable energy because renewable energy may not be able to power um, those energy gasless. So we have also done a lot. We have put the necessary policies in place, the, 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 the regulations in place to kind of establish an attractive and level playing field for the uptake of renewable energy. And I'm sure you might have mentioned the Renewable Energy Act A32, which is in place. What we are now working around the clock to achieve is to establish the Renewable Energy Fund. It is very critical towards the success of the Renewable Energy Act. And consultants are working around the clock to ensure that the, this fund is, in, is put in place to give meaning and direction to the Renewable Energy Act as has been um, put in place. So again, if you look at the building sector, the building sector, um, a lot remains to be done there. So um, we also have put in place standards and uh, we are now working on regulations that will begin to look at the building sector. That is going to be looked at the building sector. So very soon, when the regulations are passed, we are going to have um, um, ratings for um, public buildings so that this glass and case buildings that have uh, that are trying to uh, overtake Ghana will have to uh, find a way of regulating them. Um, I think that because we are running late, I will pause here and we will be glad to I'll be glad to join the discussion if we have time to do that. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Director. I think you have done exceedingly well uh, with time and uh, also uh, information. And this is the time where audience, our audience, uh, distinguished audience must also speak. I have two questions already uh, in the chat line. Uh, and these questions can be answered by uh, first uh, the policymaker, Mr. Kofi Ajako, and then we will get from the perspective of academia, 
uh, Prof will also uh, give a perspective to. The first question is, how can we incorporate biogas into the energy mix? And then the second question is, how can Ghana use regulations to bring down the cost of solar installation? Um, there is also a hand up, uh, Cecilia, if Cecilia can unmute uh, and then ask her questions, but there are already two questions. How can regulations be used to uh, bring down the cost of solar insulation? And then how can we include biogas into the energy mix? Is Cecilia still with us? Right, okay, so can Mr. Um, Kofi, um, uh, Mr. Kofi Jaco, uh, respond first, and then we will have our uh, eminent speaker, Professor Samuel Jemfi, also give a perspective to the two questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, the questioner. Solar prices. How do we use regulation to bring the prices down? It's a very difficult one. We are working in a free market environment. And um, if there is any business person on this call, the, that person will tell you that the final price of the commodity is amalgamation of a lot of costs. Cost price, insurance, freight, handling, everything. And then the final consumer takes the all combined price of the appliers. Um, to answer it simply, my dear, the technology is not ours. We have the raw material. The raw material is sun radiation. That is all that we have. But the technology belongs to another person who has the liberty to price it the way he wants to price it. The, the only thing that regulation is trying to do is that we have now tried to impose um, taxes and duties on the imported ones, and we are giving rebate incentive for locally assembled solar panels and other gadgets. So that is the extent to which regulation can go to bring down the prices, but regulation cannot command and control a free market economy. So that is one. Then the second question is about inclusion of biogas. I'm glad you have brought this uh, topic up. Personally, I have uh, uh, a number of calls people complaining about bad biogas installation for which they have paid huge sums of money. We are now working to come up with standards and regulations. Once that is done, then it gives us the Energy Commission the mandate to um, ensure that biogas becomes another good, and underline the word good, good um, form of energy. But as it is now, it is all play all. And people who are not so good are doing the installations, and that is even diminishing um, the interest of Ghanaians in, in, in biogas. So it is high on the radar, and then we are working on the standards and the regulation. That will give us the muscles to be able to uh, make it another good form of energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kofi. I, um, I think we, it is, we can, will our uh, distinguished professor want to add anything to it or else we go to the next set of questions? I think we, we can go to the next set of questions. But very well, to, so, uh, yeah, so we that, have uh, Israel Baden we have Israel Baden hands up. Uh, can we hear Israel Baden? Uh, pardon me, please. 
Um, we want to pick the questions from the Q&A because it's a webinar. It means upgrading people to the panelists. So please put your questions in the Q&A. Those that can't be answered live would definitely be answered in the Q&A chat. Thank you very much. Very well. So currently, I think we have uh, exhausted the questions in the Q&A. We, the other questions, which I, I think it's, uh, uh, well, a, a questioner, uh, Ebert, if we want to find out if there are scholarships for research uh, uh, programs, uh, research into energy programs, uh, and then uh, there's a, as a, there is a comment that says that he thinks that the only way to uh, reduce our energy consumption is to ensure that people are disciplined. Uh, do we, uh, can we take more questions? In the absence of any question, any other question, because of time, uh, we are going to move quickly and uh, we are going to move quickly to our next speaker. We will try and 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 put out more uh, questions if uh, another question comes up or in between the discourse. I will read the other question. Yeah. So I yeah. So our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Samuel Baden. Uh, Mr. Baden has done extensive work on plastic bottle sustainability. In fact, his MBA research uh, uh, was focused on uh, plastic uh, uh, pollution caused by buried bottles in Ghana, uh, revealing environmental harm caused by these uh, carded bottles. He has done extensive work on it. Uh, can, with a, a virtual round of applause, we welcome uh, Dr. Samuel Baden to give us his perspective on the subject. Thank you. Mr. Baden, you're welcome. You have the audience. All right. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful for this invitation. Yeah, so, so permit me to uh, give you only five minutes. Right, no Max, problem. Thank no you. Problem. No problem. No problem. Yeah, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to give a little uh, of what I have done. Uh, within this short time. Um, uh, it's been such a great time. I have learned a lot. In fact, huge, 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 huge. I've learned a lot from all the speakers and I'm grateful to all of you that you brought out the knowledge you have in this area of energy. My work has been around plastics and uh, for my master's and uh, Doctorate, it's all been about uh, plastics and specifically within the industries, those beverage industries. I try to find out what they are doing in terms of uh, trying to do something about what they produce, plastics that they produce, what they do with it. And uh, unfortunately, I found out that uh, there's very little they are doing in terms of they working on the plastics they produce in terms of converting them into something useful. It looks like they 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 produce, they make their money, and that is it. So for this particular discussion, I only want to uh, put uh, the professor says something about industry and what they should also be doing uh, in uh, in the energy to help with the energy, and I. It's something that is on my heart in the sense that I feel that the industry should take the bull by the horn and be part of helping with they are because they are making money from it. I am expecting that they should also be contributing to making the 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 system work effectively and paying for what they produce. That's what we call the EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. All over the world, people who produce uh, uh, plastics do pay these kinds of money to government to help deal with plastics. 
Unfortunately, my 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 last check in Ghana here, uh, the the producers do not pay anything, and so I am urging the little I just want to add to this discussion is that the government, as a leader of the of the country, should look at those areas where they can make money from these industry and use that money, channel it to all these we are talking about. Uh, it will help a lot. It will go a, a very long way because, as he said, there are many areas that are taking money from government. And so the the energy is only one part of it. If they are going to expand, uh, spread their tentacles, they'll be able to generate money from industries who are producing these plastics and use it, channel it in that way. It will help a lot. So... Uh, that is my opinion. I'm hoping that we will we will channel it better and get industry to also be responsible for what they produce. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. God bless us all. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, I think that we we are blessed to have your comment and assured us this is the time where the main convener of. Uh, 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 Globe Ethics, the Ghana National Contact of Globe Ethics, and Globe Ethics uh, is hosted by uh, Kingdom Equip. Kingdom Equip is a Christian governance organization and a deputy, a, a Christian governance organization. The convener and executive director of Kingdom Equip is Dr. A Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Lansa, who currently, as we speak, is transiting to a, a, a transiting somewhere. Uh, he's agreed to share, uh, to give us a, a, a talk or, or give us a remark. And so let me quickly invite in our executive that, and permit me to say that he's also my board chair at Ghana Integrity Initiative. The boss, you're welcome, you have your audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thank you, Susan, and everybody else, all the professors and uh, learned people who have spoken on the platform. Um, I just got in about 10, 15 minutes. I'm maybe not out of the aircraft. So permit me here. to just make a brief comment. You might hear a little background noise, but it's because people are now getting down from the aircraft. Um, my observation on this is simple. First and foremost, I appreciate the, the broad um spectrum of people who are involved in this uh, discourse. Very, very important. People from India, Kenya, Ghana, and also in terms of industrial comp uh, uh, constitution of a background, I see academics, I see prof practitioners, I see business people, I see um, uh, CSOs all involved. It means that the discussion is likely to be very much enriched, and uh, we appreciate this effort. And also, uh, on our part, I think two things are coming out institutional change and legislation enforcement by government. And I think that when we draw our conclusions, uh, we should please look for solutions to these two issues. The issue of how do we change people's attitudes and in terms of this, because getting people to buy into all these nice ideas, it's been always a headache. And then getting government to gather the courage to be able to partner with business to enforce these uh, reforms that we are talking about has always been a big challenge. So my prayer is that at the end of this discussion, some solid conclusions will be drawn and we can move forward on this. Stage. But this is not a new discussion, but I think this uh, discussion is very much sharper than previously held. And I pray that um, this meeting will take us to the next level. Thank you all very much for coming um, today. Thank you, boss. Uh, thank you, Reverend. Ideally, if our Reverend Minister speaks, we are safe to say that uh, the meeting can be called to a close, but we can't do that. Uh, when we do that, we will be breaking protocol. So we will, I will hand over back to Susan uh, to steer us to the close. Uh, there, if, uh, I believe uh, Professor um, Eric Oposuenki is standing by to give us a closing remark. We only have six minutes to uh, wind up. So, Susan, you have the audience uh, with your announcement and the yeah acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've had 
an exhaustive talk on energy efficiencies. And um, there's so much of information that has come forth. We'll be sharing the link to this webinar to everybody who has signed in, whether you registered and you had issues or not, we will send all that information to everyone. I see that there are a lot of questions that are coming in and we have not had time to address them. Please uh, send them continually as we are still in session to the Q&A and I will invite the speakers to please try and answer these questions. There are so many questions that are coming in. Some are on the policy on net metering in Ghana to do with um, conflicting development among low income people and so on and so forth. These are all in the Q&A. I invite the speakers to please try and address them before we leave here. We are running out of time. So quickly, I will continue and give us just some few information just a little bit of information for our attention. Okay, whilst I'm waiting for them, let me just remind you that this webinar is hosted by Globe Ethics Western African Center in Accra in collaboration with the Regional Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability at the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Please visit us on, at uh, Globe Ethics at www.globeethics.net and access our resources there. You will have access to our library, which has extensive collections on ethical materials and content. I will be sharing in the chat links to the library co collections addressing ethics of sustainability and environmental justice for you to access. This will also be sent to you when we send you further information about this webinar and the feedback form for you to give us your feedback on the conversations we've had here today. So that's, and you'll have access to our vast network and pool of experts who work together with us to further the vision of ethical transformation across societies. I also want to now introduce some courses being offered by our partner, the RLCs. The RLCs is running postgraduate programs and short courses, which they would want to invite you your participation and application. To assess others. Okay. You are also welcome to partner with Globe Ethics. And these are the partnership opportunities available for you. You can join us as a competence center, offering academic or research opportunities, as higher education institution associations, as learned bodies in the field of ethics, as think tanks, as publication authors and contributors to our journal of ethics, as digital and physical library, as an international and regional organization with a special focus on diversity and as a funding and development partner. We will endeavor to say all these informations. I know it sounds a little bit rushed because we are trying to keep to our time in the interest of sustainability but all of this information will be sent to you, please. I want to thank you all, all our partners, the moderator who has been excellent so far, Kofi Ejako. He had to rush in to join us from a meeting elsewhere. Reverend Dr. Kutsi was in transit. Um, also the director of RCs in the person of Professor Owusu Nchi. Our special speaker himself, Professor Samuel Jenfi. Our thanks also goes to the team at the University of Energy and Natural Resources, who has been splendid in supporting us in this process. And all the volunteers here who are supporting me to bring you this event. We'll be having further conversations 
as time goes on and all of these will be sent to you so that you can continue to engage with us in the interest of sustainability. I want to, at this moment, welcome again, Professor Eric ofosu Chi, the Director of the Regional Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability to give us his closing remarks. Then we can be out of here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susan. It's been a great session this morning, very inspiring, very informative. And we appreciate what Global Ethics has done for us today through this webinar. Um, Prof. Jenfi, um, you are a gem. And I always feel proud that we pulled you all the way from New Zealand to Ghana. Your impact on the energy landscape in Ghana has been amazing. And this morning, you've just shown a demonstration of it. And we want to really appreciate the efforts you have put in this. You have really educated us and we are going home with a lot of take-homes, especially the fact that you made us aware that our oil reserve we have cannot take us in the next half of the decade. And the fact that we have high losses in our transmissions, and you also point out a lot of lessons for us from other countries. I'm very fascinated about your take-home and energy efficiency being an aid in reducing the environmental impact of burning fossil fuels, which is very true. And then it is a tool to develop smarter ways of managing our finite resources. And lastly, is a bridge for us to develop clean fuel technologies, and renewable energy resources. Thank you so much. And I want to really appreciate uh, Mr. Kofi Jakun from the Energy Commission, who has really been trans, um, trumpeted energy efficiency I remember he took us through one year of school and uh, examination. If you look at, I mean, Professor Jenfi and myself writing exams on energy efficiency, thanks to Mr. Kofi Ejako to make us professionals. And today we are so proud of how he's driving the energy efficiency agenda of Ghana and setting up these SESs. Um, we appreciate, I mean, the policies that are being developed, especially adding on more appliances which have to be standardized. We are very, very happy with that. And thanks to our gentleman also who is handling the plastics conversion. I mean, you are a trailblazer in it and we, we, we give you great applause. We want to thank our executive director who had time also to, to join us and, and speak to this um, occasion. For Global Ethics, I just asked Prof. Genfi, we, we need to come and meet you so that we get into an MOU because we believe that you are the right partner for our CS. And I also want to take opportunity to thank our guest from Sierra Leone seated with us here today, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Rio Bay College, University of Sierra Leone, um, Engineers for Change, um, the Innovation Hub from Sierra Leone and another partners and students. We are very grateful, RCs. We are very proud of our staff and our faculty for making this um, occasion come true. Thanks to the media team for making us go live. And I, I really appreciate the role you have played, your dedication to this service. Susan, you've been awesome. And our moderator, you are just excellent. Please, let's, let's have more interaction on how we can continue to project um, this energy efficiency agenda. And I believe that we will all go back home and then turn our ways to what? One good friend tells me that he has a paid job in his house. He gave his son an assignment that if you're able to save electricity in the house by a certain amount every month, I give you 50%. And by virtue of that, his son is making money and he's also saving money. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Um, hearing you talking to you is this event wouldn't have been possible without your singular support. And for this, we at the Western African Center in Accra are deeply grateful. Our mission, which will not continue to withhold, goes to engineer Professor Samuel Jemfi. He brought us a wealth of information and a challenge at the end of his presentation. And we are promising to run with the work he has already started and other great works like that from Dr. Sami Baidin and the work at the Energy Commission being championed by Mr. Kofi Ejako. Thank you so much to all our panelists. 
thank you for the visiting team. We are glad to have had you with us in this session. And for all the wonderful people who are seated right there at the University of Energy and Natural Thank you so much for being with us. Now it is, but this is just brief. We continue the conversation in the interest of sustainability in further search engagement. We look forward to hosting you then. Thank you and bye for now for keeping with us throughout this two hours plus. Thank you also to Mr. Michael Boydi. You have done an excellent job of moderating in of you and the support of the Ghana Integrity Initiative. Thank you so much and bye for now. Bye-bye.